Hi, so welcome back to the Apprentice One to One podcast. I'm your host, Mark, and this one is a little bit different. Um, it's in response to a number of people who've actually asked for my industry story. Um, they've been coming in for a number of weeks, and I haven't been ignoring them on purpose, but it's kind of been important to me that this podcast is about other people, um, showing the wide range of stories and routes into the trade. Um, but I couldn't ignore mine forever. I think it is semi-interesting. Um, and certainly trying to think about some of the things I've done and the route I've taken has made me realise that actually, you know, some of the stuff we do along the way in our careers that it maybe doesn't seem important or that big a deal at the time is actually quite cool and interesting. So I think there's some, some pretty decent things I've been involved with through the course of my career. And um, yeah, I'm happy to chat about them on, on the Apprentice One to One podcast. Hopefully it's going to be of some use, and if not, I've just wasted 45 minutes of my time, so it's no big deal to me. Um, yeah, so going back to right at the start, which is usually where I ask people to begin, it, it makes sense. So when I was in um, in junior school, um, there was issues identified with my um, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and I was put into sort of what they would have called, I suppose, special classes at the, that time. Uh, there was concerns over over my ability academically, shall we say, and you know that kind of persisted in in my school life into secondary school. And um, while you wouldn't know it to look at me now, I excelled um, sportingly. I was among the best in my age group at just about any sport you could imagine. I could turn my hand to to all sorts of physical activity. And I think thinking back, that was my way of trying to prove to some of my peers at school that you know I was. Um, I was good for something, I was worthy, I was useful, I wasn't just a thick idiot. Um, and really, in my learning at school, it kind of it kind of hit me in a, in a maths assignment. It was around year 10, I think, and the teacher was Mr Hickman, I remember it very well. Um, set a project, I mean, I was in the bottom of all of my groups at secondary school, so we were kind of placed into groups back then. I don't know how it is in school now, but that's how it was then. And I was in all the bottom groups, and this maths teacher, um, set this particular assignment and it was kind of analysing data and trying to you know find out what the outcome of that was using formula and things and I'd never had it explained in the way he explained it before and, and I think he recognised some of the struggles I was having so you know I excelled in that project I did really well um, I got some good grades and it kind of hit me in a wave of how I can actually teach myself and learn and that's what I started to do so I, I stepped away from the way things were been taught to me and the things I was been told in school that kind of academically you you just don't have that ability if you like you need all this extra support and, and such I mean I wasn't a, a bad kid in school I was quite good I had a good circle of friends and um, you know they were all academically quite intelligent and uh, at a level above myself at that time but kind of after that point I realized you have to put the effort in the onus is on you as a learner to get the best out of school I think I realized just in time so at the start of year 10, all of my grades started to improve. I figured out how I could work around some of the issues I have with learning and um, build on my knowledge. And I started to move up some of those groups in the course of year 10 and year, year 11. Uh, and after that, um, I did really well at GCSEs. I got some good grades. Um, you know, I'm quite proud of those, actually. And it, and it showed to myself, I think it was that competitiveness in me that some of my friends were excelling in, in the academic side of their, their lives and whilst I was um, doing better than sportingly, if you like, um, I wanted to be competitive in that as well. It's just in my nature, I think, to be competitive with others. It wasn't in a, in a bad way of wanting to be better than them. It was just trying to show that actually I can do that as well. And uh, yeah, ended up doing pretty well. Um, went off into to college and um, electrical and electronics so I have a, a keen interest in both of those things and that comes from my um, granddads so one of them was a mechanical engineer in the merchant navy he was always tinkering around with cars and motorbikes he had triumph bikes suzuki honda bikes I'm not a bike guy I don't know anything about them I just know they looked amazing and he was always working on them he had an RS2000 car as well which was his pride and joy so to see him on a weekend tinkering with all those things was kind of inspiring to me to get involved in stuff technically and understand how things work. So I still have that now. I still, as a, as a hobby, mess about mechanically with my old Land Rover that I'm always getting told off for playing with. 
And uh, yeah, my other granddad was in the building trade, so after the Second World War he was involved with, with building and doing electrical things and he was always tinkering in his workshop and stuff while I was a kid and doing bits and pieces. He wasn't actually one of these older people who didn't know how to work video players and TVs, he always had the, the top end tellies and videos and stuff and camcorders back then as it was and he would show me how they worked, um, explain the electronics of them and I was always really interested in that. So when I went into a college environment to kind of push that knowledge along with electrical um, was, was key to me and didn't realise at the time that that made me a little bit um, different in the trade. It wasn't until I came into the work um, environment that I realised having that knowledge was quite a beneficial thing to a, an employer. So um, one of my first employed roles um, was as an electrical engineer for a company that provided um, security products. And I have to be careful in what I speak about this because some of it is covered by the Official Secrets Act and I'm still not sure exactly what I am and aren't allowed to talk about. Um, it's over 15 years ago now so most of what was happening back then is hopefully now obsolete and it's no longer in use but I will be a bit generic with it. So I was a, an electrician and an electronics engineer um, and within my role with that employer we provided um, electronic security uh, products and devices to um, police forces, to big um, national events in the country, so um, Wimbledon, Entry, uh, the Ryder Cup, all these kind of things to keep the, the um, organisers and sports people um, safe and protesters for example and unable to get access to them using electronic security. So um, we'd be pulling in cabling for things like that and making sure that the services were in place to run all of that but also commissioning the um, the way these things connected to each other. So at that time, which I mean now it would seem simple, we're all, I'm recording this now on YouTube, it's going out into the cloud and all of the rest of it for anyone to watch from wherever they like. But at that time, that kind of technology wasn't available and we were using wireless networks to stream video and make it monitorable um, and recordable for security personnel to respond to an incident or to kind of contain what's going on. Um, and that kind of progressed in a role into military areas. So obviously with September the 11th, 2001, um, there was a big increase in awareness of keeping military um, assets and such safe um, from attack and also from protesters and other things like that. And it's ironic to think that the military needs some assistance with their, their security, um, but they did. And we provided that, it went into prisons as well. It was used by police forces. Um, so there's, there's air bases in this country for uh, the Ministry of Defence here, so the, the Royal Air Force and also the United States Air Force, where we would put these security products into use and we would go and, and, and commission them and install them. So I've been in some quite interesting places of national infrastructure over here. Um, the, the ones I can think of, there was a CCTV system we were putting into um, a, a bunker uh, on an air base. And, you know, I've never been so nervous in my life because there's a lot of ammunition and, and stuff like that in this workplace. So tethering your tools was vital, uh, making sure that you were following the rams to the letter, um, obviously, is key. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of pressure when if you make a mistake, something quite catastrophic could go wrong. So that's kind of been ingrained into me for, from a, quite an early age. I was only in my early 20s at that time. That, you know having a safe system of work is, is vital for keeping you and other people safe so that was a real good grounding for me in that respect um, but yeah it was it was interesting to see how those people kind of operate and the kind of environments they work in um, you know these things were used outside of this country as well so I was involved in projects abroad um, there was a, an air base for the Americans for example where we installed some uh, fiber optic network and camera systems um, on an island in the Atlantic and that was really interesting and at the time I think I was probably 24 years old and I just had um, my second son Nathan well he was probably two or three at the time so to leave the family for a period of weeks and go off and do something like that was a bit daunting for me I hate flying as well so when I was over there doing that I had all the, the, the stress and I didn't actually understand what that was at the time because I'd never felt anything like that so I was missing home, missing my kids, stressed with the project and the work and uh, you know that's the mental health side of things that was a really really tough tough job um, but I was keen to do it 
because we were providing um, a service that was keeping people safe. So we were keeping military personnel safe. That was something I was actually quite proud to do. And um, yeah, this stuff went into protecting some of the rapid response aircraft in Canada, for example. Um, you know, there was there was police forces in this country who were using the technology to kind of have remote CCTV vans driving around their cities and then able to monitor them from a central location. And again, that sounds simple now, but at that time, it certainly wasn't. It was it was quite different. And I was part of a big team doing this. It wasn't you know just me. I don't want to make it sound like that. I was running off all over the world doing these things. There was lots of other people involved, and you know it's just a really interesting time. And I was thinking, actually back to one of the experiences through that job. I mean, the guy who owned the business was an absolute sensation. He was the finest salesman I have ever seen. He could sell ice to Eskimos, I know he could. Um, you know, he was absolutely incredible. To see how he operated and worked, you know, was was, was amazing. And um, well, he had flaws in other areas, as everybody does. That was one of his key strengths. And I took a lot from him and from that at that time. And yeah, he, uh, he kind of, pushed me towards some of the more the, the demonstrating and getting involved in the sales side of things. And that kind of got my interest in business, if you like, as well. So I think I was I was probably 23, 24, based on my recollection of, of time frame. And he, he sent me with um, a couple of other people to demonstrate and set up a, a sales pitch to NATO and the United Nations kind of military personnel at The Hague. So, you know, as a 24-year-old, your boss is saying, oh, yeah, I want you to go off and do this, pack the van up and get everything ready to go and do your demo. And you're just like, oh, yeah, whatever, okay, where are we going? Sounds exciting on a, on a ferry trip, um, driving across into Europe, all great. And it wasn't really until I arrived there, I guess that's the bravado of, of youth, if you like, you don't really have the fear. If I knew that now, I would probably be prepping for weeks in advance, trying to make sure that I... Um, I've nailed down that presentation and um, you know I'm, I'm comfortable in delivering it but at that time I literally put no thought into it whatsoever other than you know have I got my passport with me <laughs> that was as much as thought as I put in so when you get there and you're kind of taken into this room and all these guys and girls are in their military uniforms and they're full of badges and stars across the chest and stuff and you start to actually dawn on you holy crap this is this is a room full of some quite serious people and um, you know I wasn't prepared for it properly at all but but we did really well the presentation went really well because I kind of always have had a knack of being able to um, verbalize things in a way that seemed to get across to people I don't know maybe it's just a just a, a way of my own personality maybe I don't know so I can be quite boring at times I'm well aware of that but equally when it's kind of like trying to express how something works or how a, a benefit of a product or even a weakness to something, I've always been quite good at explaining that. And so when the questions came in from that room, I was able to kind of answer them very well. And, and I wasn't aware, but my boss actually had one of his close business associates in that meeting watching what I was doing. And the feedback he gave um, was, was really good. And, um, you know, I was kind of pushed more towards a, a management role at an early age because of that um, so yeah that was quite interesting just thinking about that actually going off as a 23 24 year old and that's the age Matthew is now and I wouldn't dream of sending him to do something like that to be fair um, you know it's quite it's quite an achievement and at the time you don't realize these things it's just your job I was you know I wasn't paid anything like enough for, for the job I did then um, you know that's something else I've learned as time's moved on but sometimes what you're doing isn't just about the money it was fantastic experience and to, to take all of that knowledge at that time in my career is worth more than any wage packet could have been you know I took such a lot out of that job and um, you know we the Queen for example came to visit York Races and we set up a, a security system at the, the residence she was staying in in the local area to ensure her safety I mean, and working with some of the security personnel in and around that was incredible to see the kind of things that go on. So that was where really my key knowledge and learning of coming from an electrical and electronics background. So I was kind of multidisciplined, understood um, both sides of how that works, because it is different. We are taught differently um, as electrical apprentices to how electronics engineers are taught. And Craig O'Neill references some of that in his videos. It is true. 
and it, I don't understand quite why, um, but that's the way it is. And yeah, anyway, as as time moved on, because of that kind of um, business training, if you like, I was given without knowing I was being given it. To be fair, um, that business was sold, and the large part of the staff was relocated to the south of the country. I didn't want to move with the the wife and kids at the time, so Matthew was probably six or seven, maybe Nathan three or four, and um, through the circumstances in my private life, and I won't talk about those because they involve other people as well in my family and it's not my business to share um, exactly the details of that, but I decided to set up my own business. I was in a position where I could do that and be um, comfortable and confident in doing it. Um, so that's what I did, that's what PowerSonic started from. So I had that knowledge as being an electrician, uh, the knowledge of being an electronics engineer, um, so I've got a high national diploma in electronics, um, communications and engineering. And I've also got my NVQ3 and gold card and all of my other electrical qualifications as well. So, um, and that's been the case since my early 20s. So I'm always, always, always pushing myself academically, if, if you like. And getting the business training within that job gave me the confidence to start PowerSonic. And I've kind of been going along with that ever since. So, you know, that's over 15 years now, and there's ups and downs to it all. Absolutely, there is. Uh, there's no, you know, if it was an easy easy thing to do, everyone would be doing it, as, as they say. Um, but I try to run my business as best I can. I'm certainly not a business guru. If you're looking for kind of business advice, there's people uh, in my network who I look up to. So there's, there's Neil, for example. He's a fantastic businessman. Um, people in the industry have really stepped out of their comfort zones and pushed themselves. So you've got rich from the art of smart you know that's absolutely incredible so if you've got an interest in, in business and growing and developing a, a brand and, and building this this exciting thing then go and follow those guys check out what they're doing you know it is, it is incredible what you can achieve if you have that determination and focus and um, will to keep pushing and, and progressing so you know my kind of aims have been a bit smaller than that in just operating a, an electrical contracted business, business that sustains me and a small team of people and um, that's always the way I will be. I have no grand plans to kind of take over the industry and be in some massive electrical contracting firm. You know, it's just not a motivation for me to do that. Um, I have a motivation to increase um, standards and offer value to my clients and kind of operate my business like that. That's progression a little bit out of the apprenticeship. I kind of want to show you the, the journey you can go on. So I started off as someone who was really, really struggling in, in school early on in my um, learning journey if you like back as a six seven year old and that kind of stuck with me as a tag if you like into secondary school and I almost believed that myself that you know I just couldn't do this I, it wasn't in me to to be academically intelligent and I kind of guess uh, awakening is maybe a stupid way to say it but something happened in secondary school around sort of the age of 15 when um, you know I realized that I could do those things you know, I could I could teach myself these things and um, use other learning methods to gain the knowledge that I needed, and it was kind of a, a snowball from there with that thirst for learning and knowledge and progression, and then taking some of the input from family and friends. That's often the way it goes with people in the trades that you have someone in your family in the past who's been involved with it, and um, yeah, that was always my keen interest. I, I could have gone off onto a journey into university. I had achieved the grades to do that if I wanted, um, but it was never really my focus or interest. I always knew that I wanted to be kind of hands-on out on site. I don't actually like the management and paperwork side of the job I've got now. In fact, I really dislike it. I much prefer to be out doing stuff and I will purposely try and avoid um, sitting down to do paperwork and sales and marketing and all of the rest of it if I can get away with it. So yeah, that's, that's always been my interest and in, taking the route of um, an electrical apprentice and then going into electronics and engineering I think was always something that I wanted to do. You have to like what you do at the end of the day. That's one of the key things I always tell people. There's no point learning how to do something to, just to make money or to survive. You spend so much of our lives working. You need to actually enjoy it. It needs to be something that you are you're keen to do. Otherwise, it's, it's pointless. You know, There's no point wasting time in your life doing something that ultimately makes you miserable so you know that's that's why I went on this journey that's where I have gone into the trade uh, I'm now in and I think tying that all into apprentice one-to-one -one, 
So going back to that time where I was quite competitive and wanting to get better academically and, um, you know, showing that support to military personnel. So anyone who served our country are absolute heroes to me. To put yourself up for, for service like that, and, and not just in, in the military, but in the police, um, the NHS and um, any kind of public service role. You know, I've used admiration for those people. And to do my little bit at that time, I felt quite proud of. So the stuff we was doing was keeping them safe, um, making their jobs easier to do. Um, so some of these products were deployed out in, in the Middle East and they were used to, to keep military personnel safe from in, improvised explosive devices, for example. Or if there was potential attacks with, with vehicles and suicide bombers on air bases in this country, that, that the things we were installing would prevent people getting hurt because of that act. And, you know, the seriousness and responsibility on us as, as the people designing, commissioning, installing, these kind of things, you know, that, that weighed heavily on me, um, that we are responsible for people's safety. And I think that's kind of that feeling of wanting to help people um, has pushed me into compliance in the electrical industry, so sort of on a subconscious level, I think. And then with the apprenticeship route as well, seeing that that kind of, is an area of industry that isn't really looked after in the best way I think kind of pushed me to towards that avenue as well um, you know that's looking at our kind of subconscious mentality kind of level and that draws into Sam's podcast as well actually he, it's listening to some of the guests on his show has got me thinking about these things well how did I actually end up where I am now what's kind of been my journey on it all and I think there is an element of that in everyone's route into where they actually end up you know without realising it so yeah, I think that's kind of what drew me towards kind of raising awareness of the issues within the apprentice in industry, trying to stand shoulder to shoulder with apprentices and employers and lecturers and anyone who was keen and motivated to see that held up as the pinnacle of the industry. So yeah, I think I think there was a little bit of that in my character that kind of pushed me to do apprentice one to one, with never even realising it. So it's just interesting the way that our career journeys can, can go along. And I'm 40 years old now, so I've still got plenty of life in the old dog. Who knows quite where I'm going to go as, as time moves along. And really the purpose of the Apprentice One to One podcast is just to show you know, how someone can come into the industry and where they can end up on these journeys. And there's been all sorts of people coming on. There's loads of other people coming on as well who are going to tell their, their stories. And I thought it was relevant and important to tell mine. And I don't want to turn this into an hour-long podcast about it. Um, you know, there's there's loads of other content out there on Apprentice One to One from far more interesting people than myself. Um, and my key message to it is, if someone's telling you that you're you're too thick to do something, don't listen. You can do anything you want. Um, there is ways to learn this stuff and um, succeed if if you want. And it doesn't have to be in an electrical apprenticeship. It can be absolutely anything. Um, just believe in yourself stay motivated, um, keep going and find a way that works for you. Um, there's, everyone's different. You know, the, the academic route of sitting in classrooms isn't for everybody. The practical skills that you need to go out and do the job isn't for everyone. So it's finding what you like and um, what you're comfortable with and just keep on that path. Um, keep working hard towards it. And eventually, as time moves along, there's no instant gratification from any of this. So you're not going to decide you want to be an electrician and then 12 months later you're going to be one. You're just not. It's a it's a process and you have to keep grinding away at it. And eventually, as you move on in your life, you realise, well, actually, I took those steps and you know here I am now, without even realising that's what you're doing. So while this four-year apprenticeship can seem like forever, it can seem like a bit of a drag and a drain, and um, certainly at the minute with coronavirus, you know, keep putting those hard yards in, keep going because the electrical industry is about to, you know, I think emerge into a period of massive growth. Uh, there's huge potential for people to do very well for themselves. And if we can help um, encourage the skilled and vibrant workforce we're going to need to carry out all that work, then everybody wins. Um, and so, yeah, just keep going in your training, keep going in your learning. If you want to ask me any other questions, I'm always happy to help. Apprentice One to One is open to absolutely anyone. We don't exclude or try and um, push people away or 
here is better than anyone else. You know, that's not what it's about. It's inclusive to everybody. It's an open forum for people to have a voice as well. So apprentices have got somewhere to go and actually say their experiences and say what's happening to them and get that support. Um, you know, it's, it's a listening forum, if you like. And, you know, we will never turn anybody away or say that you're, you're wrong in what you're thinking. We'll listen and try and understand and try and help. And if the end result of that is that a few more people progress in their electrical careers, then all of the better. Um, so, yeah, that was kind of it. That's, that's my story. As boring as it may be, take it or leave it. And uh, I wish you every success in your learning journey. Thanks for watching.